I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm just fine, thank you. How are you? Chipper as a chipmunk. Happy as a donkey. <laughs> well, I'm glad you are, because Flash Gordon has taken a trip to the moon, and I want to see what he's doing there, because I've never been to the moon before. Very well, then. I won't waste any more time. Goody. Read me the funnies, please. Puck the Comic Weekly? Mm -hmm. All right, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the top of the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. <laughs> Hoppy had saved Don Raymond's ranch from being sold to the outlaw sloat. As Hoppy brought the deed to the ranch to give to Don Raymond, he saw a huge urn and discovered within it Sloat. When Hoppy kicked the urn over and broke it, Sloan slipped out of the window and disappeared. Hoppy, Lucky, California, and Don Ramon are after him. Finally, they rein in. California says, No sign of Sloat anywhere. Critter must have known we were tailing him and give us a slip. Hoppy replies, I hope that's the answer. I hate to think he was deliberately drawing us away from that hacienda for some reason. Quickly, they gallop back to the hacienda to find out. They arrive at the ranch, last picture, second row, and discover Chico the guard lying on the ground unconscious. In the big picture in the next row, Don Raymond discovers that his son, Felipe, is gone. Lucky says, Then Sloat's escape was an ornery trick to lure us away so somebody could grab that boy. Quickly, the men mount. California says, first picture, next row. We can't have gotten far. Mount up. We're searching the countryside. <laughs> Meanwhile, several miles away, first picture, next row, Sloat and his gang, who have captured Felipe, have arrived in an old abandoned stone quarry where they intend to hide out. Sloat says, All right, climb down, Felipe. This will be your new home for a spell. Till you decide to tell us where that Madeira Spanish land grant's hidden. The men dismount. Sloat turns his back on Felipe and says to the men, last picture of the row, All right, relax, boys. We'll wait till Peavy gets here. Suddenly, Felipe reaches inside his shirt, pulls out a gun, and whirls on him, saying, You will wait with your hands up, I think. Last picture, one of the outlaws says, Hey, what is this? I thought the kid was blind. Felipe holds his gun on him and says, I was, until the sun blindness wear off. And now that you have shown me your hideout, we will wait for this peavy, eh? Oh, goody, goody, goody. Wasn't that smart of Felipe not to let them know that he could see again? Yes, this way he pretended to be a sleeping dog until he got him where he wanted him. Yes, and now you'll hold them there and capture them all and turn them over to Hoppy, I'll bet you. Well, let's hope so. I think young boys do some wonderful things in the funnies. I think so, too. And next week we'll find out how this turns out. Now what? Oh, is it time for Prince Val yet? Oh, you bet it is. So just turn over the page... And there he is on page three. You remember, last week Val and his friends were crossing the mountain and they got up to the high peaks and a big snow slide came and blocked the way in front of them. And the guide, a man named Paul, told them that they should camp for the night and hope that in the morning the snow would be frozen hard so they could cross over. Let's read and see where the snow is frozen. All right, here we go with Prince Val. Eckert, Breckert, Gray, Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. Don't 
dawn comes, and one by one, Prince Valiant and his friends untangle themselves from the huddle they had formed to keep warm. All except young Art. He seems stupefied with cold and stumbles as he walks. They're in luck. The avalanche of soft snow that had blocked the pass is now frozen hard, and they make their way carefully but safely across. As they move along, Val, last picture top row, watches his boy squire anxiously, his lips moving in a silent prayer, for well he knows the agony that is in store for the lad. They get across the patch of frozen snow safely and come to the top of the peak in the big picture in the middle of the page and discover that now the way slants downward. France is behind them, Italy ahead. For a time, mist obscures the way. Then the wind draws it aside like a curtain, and they look down on a billowing sea of clouds through which glittering peaks go marching across the sky. It's a beautiful sight they see, but they don't pause to look at it long. They make their way down through the clouds that hang around the peaks. Never did Harp think that he would go hiking in such a high spot that he would be walking through clouds. First picture, bottom row. The way leads down into the clouds, a wet and twilight world of swirling mists. The wind swirls the clouds around them until it seems that they're walking in a snowstorm. They can't see their way and it's too dangerous to risk their lives in the high mountains in this fog. They can go no further. In a sheltered spot, men and animals huddle together for a warmth, waiting for the clouds to lift. Snow falls, and then night. Morning comes at last, bright and clear. And Val looks anxiously at Arf. The lad's face is white with pain. His frozen feet are thawing out. Oh, I hope that poor Arf's feet aren't really frozen because there aren't any doctors up there. No, next week we'll find out more about his condition. This is really a dangerous adventure way up there in the mountains in the fog and the clouds. Yes, it certainly is. Well, now what? Oh, is it time for my little pal, Donald Duck? I believe it is. So turn over the page, go past Barney Google and Snuffy Smith, past Jungle Jim, turn over the next page, and there he is in the middle of page six, Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squiddly chick a -chack. Let's have music to better quack quack. Donald's nephews, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, are downtown tying a rope around a lonesome looking dog. Dewey says, I'll be sure it's tied tight. And then they start off down the street. They pull and pull and pull. But the dog won't budge. So Louie says, hey, Go around behind and push. And Huey replied, Yeah, I guess he's a little bashful. So Huey goes behind the dog, and Louie and Dewey pull, and Huey pushes. But the dog won't budge. Last picture, top row, Huey says, Hey, hold it, fellas. I got an idea. And he dashes into a second-hand store. <laughs> First picture bottom row comes running out. And he's carrying something. Dewey says... A carpet sweeper. And Huey says... Yep, for just two bits. Now watch. And he puts the dog on the carpet sweeper. And Dewey and Louie push. And away they go with a scared dog riding on the sweeper. And Huey says... I guess we better stick to alleys, just in case. <laughs> Next picture, they lift the sad-faced dog over a fence. And as they grunt and push, Louie says, That's a trouble with Alice. Dead ends. Finally, they're at the front doorstep. By now, the dog looks frightened as a pup in a storm. They push him into the house. And last picture, into the living room, where Donald is reading his paper. Donald looks at the old dog, and the dog looks at Donald. <laughs> and Dewey says, 
He followed us home, Uncle Donald. May we keep... Oh, isn't that sweet? That sweet, sweet dog. <laughs> well, I think he's rather a homely-looking mutt. No dog is homely. All dogs are sweet. Even the dogs who growl at you? No dogs ever growl at me because I love dogs and they know it. Maybe they know you're kind. Maybe they do because I'm always kind to animals. I'm glad to hear that. And maybe if more people were kind to animals, animals would be kind to people. Uh-huh. Oh, I just love the way they pushed that dog all the way home. And then when the dog didn't want to go, and then they said it followed them home. <laughs> yes. Well, now let's read Dagwood and Blondie. Yes, let's read Dagwood and Blondie. All right, let's read Dagwood and Blondie. Here it is in the first page of the second section. And here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Where I'm a food, I'm a fum, zim, zim, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Alexander tells Dagwood... Hey, Papa, I just heard Mama mention spring house cleaning. Dagwood screams, Oh, no! I simply can't go through another spring house cleaning as long as I live. And Alexander says, We hate it, too, Pop. And Cookie says sorrowfully, It means cold meals. Last picture top row, the tears roll down Dagwood's face, and he moans, Furniture piled up in the middle of the room. Everything in confusion and chaos. <laughs> and Alexander starts to cry. Yeah, yeah, it goes on for days and days. The first picture next row, Dagwood exclaims, I've got it. I'll call in a crew of professional house cleaners to do the job in a jiffy. And Alexander says, Oh, Mama wouldn't permit that. She likes to do it herself. Dagwood replies, you get Mama out of the house for the day and leave the rest to me. So the kids take Blondie to the movies and the zoo. And as soon as they've gone, Dagwood sends for the professional house cleaners. And second picture, third row, the cleaners are giving the house a thorough going over. They clean the ceiling, the walls, the floor, the rugs, the furniture, the lamps. As a matter of fact, the only thing they don't clean is the gleam in Dagwood's eye. Last picture, third row, Dagwood says cheerfully, well, whatever it costs, it'll be worth it. And one of the cleaners says, it'll cost you $40. First picture, bottom row, the house is spick and span, and the cleaners have gone. The children bring Blondie back, and Dagwood greets her. Look, dear, the house is spotless from top to bottom. And Blondie replies, I'm glad you noticed it. I know how you all hate spring cleaning, so I've been doing it a little at a time for the past three weeks without telling you. I finished yesterday. Dagwood drops on a chest in the hall, pounding it with his fist. Oh, <laughs> $40! <laughs> and Alexander says, Hey, Papa, don't let yourself go like that. But in Dagwood's head, around and around goes the thought. Forty dollars! Well, isn't that just like a man? He didn't even notice that the house had been cleaned. No, 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 just a minute. He was very thoughtful and was throwing Bondi a big favor. Well, he was doing it for himself so he wouldn't be bothered. Well... I can see right now we aren't going to get along. Oh, yes, we are. Even though you're wrong, I still like you. Oh, thank you very much. And even though you're right, I still like you. That's fine. Now, read Roy Rogers, please. Very well, I will in just a moment. But first, use that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the bottom of page one of the second section, Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. A yip fi Now, here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip fi <laughs> Roy Rogers has captured the outlaw who tried to steal Blackjack, the wonderful lead steer owned by Wildwood O'Dowd. Roy's friend, Doleful Hawkins and Wildwood, have gone back to prepare for the cattle drive over the mountains. Roy's taking the outlaw to town to turn him over to the sheriff. They approach a bridge over a stream. Roy says, Keep moving, mister. I want to hear what you tell the sheriff. 
The outlaw's hands are bound together. He's smoking his cigar, holding the cigar against the ropes, trying to burn the rope through. He says to himself, yeah, i got to get my hands loose before we cross this bridge. That's nah, working. My cigar butt's got enough fire to burn the ropes on my wrist. Suddenly, the outlaw wheels his horse against Roy. Out of over, horse! Knocks Trigger over the side of the bridge into the river. Fortunately, the river is deep enough so that Trigger isn't hurt in the fall. The outlaw calls. That'll teach you to try to outsmart Stogie Grimes. Let's go, horse. And he gallops off. <laughs> Meanwhile, Trigger makes his way to land, as Roy says, last picture top row. Stogie Grimes, eh? Well, we'll meet that sidewinder again, Trigger. And when we do, the score will be settled. First picture bottom row, Roy says, I right, stretch, boy. We gotta meet Dolfo Hawkins in Cedar Valley and get that herd moving to Rawhide. <laughs> A little later, Roy joins Doleful and Wildwood in Cedar Valley. Doleful greets him. Howdy, Roy. You look like something awful happened. I knew it would. Roy replies. Well, you're right this time, Doleful. The rustler got away from me. Sorry, Wildwood. That hombre Grimes is a good reason for not wanting that herd to get to Rawhide. Doleful suddenly says. Hark, I hear a horse coming. Probably more trouble. They see a man on horseback galloping pell-mell toward them, followed by a herd of runaway cattle. Doleful says, last picture, It's Glib Mason, the fellow who promoted the money for the trail drive. As Mason gallops toward them, he yells, Spread out! The whole blasted herd stampeding this way! I hate to say it, But that outlaw did a clever thing in bringing the rope through with his cigar. Yes, he did. He outwitted Roy this time, all right. But give Roy time. He'll get the last drop, I'm sure. I wonder whether that outlaw Stogie is to blame for the cattle running away. Well, maybe you've got something there. Maybe I have. Well, we'll find that out next week. Roy Rogers is always so exciting. Mm Mm-hmm. And I know something else that's exciting. Who do you think it's time for now? Oh, I think it's time for Flash Gordon. And he's on the next page, I'm sure. Yes, he is, and here he is. You remember Flash and Dale and Professor Bright have gone to the moon and they landed there? It's so exciting. Yes, and there's nothing on the surface of the moon at all. And uh, as they were going along bouncing, and they took every time they took a step because they were so light, a beetle man, who's that thing that looks like a beetle but is as tall as a man, grabbed Dale. So let's read quick. I want to see whether Flash saves it. Very well, then. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega rega doon doon, Saskimatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> Dale learns to her horror that the moon is inhabited by a race of weird beetle men. One of the creatures drags her into his underground tunnel, closing the trap door behind them. Hearing Dale's terrified cry for help, Flash leaps across the crater floor with 20-foot strides and catches the heavy rock door just before it closes. Last picture, top row. The beetle man frantically tries to open an inner door leading into the moon's interior. Flash doesn't dare shoot for fear of hitting Dale but he fires a warning ray blast against the wall. Suddenly, the beetle man releases Dale. First picture, bottom row. Dale whispers to Flash that she thinks the beetle man wants to make friends, that when his antenna brushed her arm, she seemed to get a telepathic message. She believes the beetle man is grateful because Flash didn't shoot him. Flash notices that the moon man does seem to be afraid and that he seems to understand orders when Flash touches his antenna. Last picture with the beetle man as prisoner, Flash leaves the ominous tunnel for future exploration, for his immediate task is to solve the secret of the meteor missiles that are bombarding the Earth, threatening it with destruction. Oh, I'm so relieved that Dale is saved. I was afraid that beetle man might have kidnapped her and that lots of others would have come and captured Flash. Well, let's hope that everyone else on the moon will be afraid of Flash's rocket pistol, too, and obey as nicely as this beetle man did. Yes. Isn't the moon a strange place? Mm Mm-hmm. 
And next week, we'll find out more about it. Oh, I certainly hope so. Now, I think it's time for Dick's adventures. Oh, yes. And they're in the middle of a battle. Dick is with John Paul Jones on a ship at sea. And an English ship attacked them, and the guns were going bang, bang, boom, boom. And I'm anxious to see who wins. Oh, very well, then. Let's go over to the last page. And here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. Riggity pack a zack a zick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Midshipman Dick is serving under John Paul Jones in the furious battle between the Yankee armed frigate Bonhomie Richard and the British man of war Serapis off the coast of Britain in 1779. Dick is reporting an alarm. We're filling fast, sir, from cannon shots below the waterline. Last picture top row, learning that his ship has not long to stay afloat, John Paul Jones does an amazing thing. He swings the battered, sinking Bonhami Richard against the side of the Serapis, lays the two ships square to each other, and lashes them together. This so that his ship won't sink. The English ship will hold it up. Shouting like madmen. The American sailors climb over the rail onto the deck of the British ship and attack the English sailors. And first picture next row, in an instant, the naval engagement flares into a hand-to-hand slaughter on the narrow battleground furnished by the decks of both warriors. Dick leaps aboard the Serapis, only to be hurled back. The flag is shot down. Dick springs over the dead and wounded to retrieve it. From the Serapis, the British commander is yelling to John Paul Jones... Have you struck your colors, Yankee? Do you give up your ship? Last picture of the row, with flashing eyes, John Paul Jones shouts back. Struck my colors? No! I've just begun to fight! First picture, bottom row. Once more, with greater fury, Dick storms aboard the Serapis. John Paul Jones is fighting beside him, slashing fiercely with his sword, hardening his handful of men. And then suddenly, Dick drops. Everything goes dizzy before him, and Dick blacks out. Hours later, Dick finds himself lying on the deck of the British Serapis out on the high seas. The Bonhomie Richard is gone. Dick moans, oh, we've lost. Then he sees something. From the mast of the Serapis, not the Union Jack, but the American flag is flying above him. And on the bridge, still in command with the British officers and crew, his prisoners, stands John Paul Jones. flying on the ship, well, that must mean that John Paul Jones must have won. Right, and he's captured the English ship in hand-to-hand fighting, took down the English flag and ran up the American flag, and then cut away his own ship, which was blown to pieces and let it sink. My, wasn't that wonderful? And he captured all the English sailors. My goodness, what a hero. Hmm, he was a great hero. I wonder what he will do next week. Well, next week we'll find out, if you'll be here. Oh, I certainly will be. Oh, look, underneath Dick's adventures, there's Rusty Riley. Yes, and things there have really come to a head. Yes, and do you remember last week that that man named Smith had gone back to the trailer ahead of Rusty and Tex, and he'd gone through Rusty's suitcase and found the picture that Rusty'd bought. And when Tex and Rusty interrupted him and said he couldn't have the picture, he grabbed a gun. Oh, yes. So now read quick. Let's see what he's going to do to Tex and Rusty. Very well. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Smith points the gun at Tex, saying, Now just do exactly what I say and you won't get hurt. Tex exclaims, Great snake, Smith. You going plumb local? Now pick that horse picture up, Rusty, from where you dropped it. And tuck it under my arm. Quick. I'm not fooling. As Rusty picks up the picture and hands it to Smith, who says sternly, Now listen. I'm locking you two in this van. And I'm going to drive it where there aren't any squad cars and state cops. 
Be sensible and you won't get hurt. He shuts the door and locks Rusty and takes in. And then quickly, he gets in the cab and drives off. Last picture, top row, Tex says to Rusty, Hey, from the feel of it, Rusty, he must be driving us over some old dirt road. A man must be plain loco to do all this for that 50-cent picture. Rusty replies, Well, maybe not, Tex. I got something to show you. Then first picture, bottom row, he hands something to Tex, saying, When I dropped that picture, the frame, uh, the back of the frame came loose, and this folded piece of paper came out. Smith didn't see it, and I put it in my pocket. Look. Tex examines the paper, saying... Hmm. It looks like a sketch of some machinery. Well, I'll be a knock-kneed maverick. Rusty, this plane is marked top secret and confidential. Looks like some kind of a new airplane engine. Golly, Smith must be a spy. The truck jolts around, and Rusty exclaims, Hey, good night, what kind of a road are we on? Dex yells, Hey, Smith, there's a racehorse in this van. You want him to break a leg? Last picture, we see where the truck is heading. Smith is going up a bumpy old dirt road in a lonely part of the country, heading for a rickety bridge. He says to himself, Ah, this is the place I was looking for. This deserted sawmill. If I get this truck across that bridge, I can put him on ice till I get a clean getaway. <laughs> big truck and that bridge doesn't look very strong. Uh, you're right about that. I hope the bridge doesn't break when the truck goes on it because Tex and the horse and Rusty are locked in the back. Yes, this is really a predicament that they've gotten into. Oh, I'm so anxious to know. I just can't wait. I'm afraid you'll have to wait until next week. Oh, I'll be here. And you know something? What? I'll be here, too. Oh, that's good. But right, that's all the time I have for today. And now before I go, here's that fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I got to go now. All right, Mr. Tommy Beasley Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the Jolly Comic Weekly Man.